Luckily, there are not a lot of tricky questions on the test. Tricky is a hustle. It's, it's one of the hardest ones for me to write. The, the real hardest one uh, would be falsely familiar. That's extremely subtle. Here, it's smart alecky. It's a hustle. So you got you to be very careful, and, and going fast is not going to help. If it's a tricky question, the only way it works against you is if you go too fast, which would work against you in any case. Chatty could be a long-winded question. could be something where they give you an extra number, and then the next time you get a chatty question, it's like, no, I think I do need these numbers this time. See, that's the kind of thing they're trying to shake out here. Do you know when to apply this and when it doesn't matter? That's right here the easiest format, probably either that or a Roman numeral. Because if you think about it, if the question says, which of the following is true, you got to eliminate three false answers. So when they go the other way, all of the following are true except, oh, cool, I can find the three true statements. And then the other one's my answer. So as long as you do this stuff systematically, you're going to do fine. And remember how it works. In the old days, which wasn't that long ago, you would actually get a score. You know, oh, I just barely passed, or wow, I got an 82. Now you either got a pass, or they give you your number, and that's bad news. So they only give you your score and how you did on the areas if you don't pass. So let's hope you don't get a score other than a P. This is the most subtle and the most dangerous and the most commonly used. They use this and chatty the most. Falsely familiar. You guys are trying to memorize. You're trying to get through a lot of confusing material. And then here, part of our answer is a very familiar phrase that you've seen. As long as the 12B1 fee does not exceed 0.25% of average net assets, and, and you are not cynical enough to think that could still be completely wrong. I've seen that before. That doesn't mean it's right. So that's just one example. You know, Part of that question is something I've seen a bunch of times. Okay. And then on the other side, oh, I've never seen that before, and therefore, therefore nothing. You've never seen it before because they're giving you a goofy answer choice. That happens a lot when I take these tests, which I don't do that often, but I have taken them. Uh, and it's often the, well, that's the weirdest answer of all four, but it is correct. You know, so you got to be very flexible. Don't discard answers you haven't seen, and don't jump on answers that look familiar just because they look familiar. It's not a memorization test. If it were, there wouldn't be so many companies uh, doing this work. And then I wish they'd give you more of these. They call multiple multiples. Is it one and two? Is it one, two, and three? Uh, so it's just it, the easiest format of all. I mean, uh, like I say, ne needlessly negative is just, well, I'm looking for three true statements, I guess. Here, it's like, oh, I know it's one, but not three. That might help me get rid of one of the answer choices. And it just seems that if you're taking a risk, it must be that your dollar will weaken, right? Um, now, I don't know why D would be tempting, except some people are told that the longest answer is probably true. We usually punish those people severely. All right. Purchasing power. Why do I have that there? Because you, maybe you got confused and you'd rather just take the back exit, you know? Purchasing power, that's, that's a different risk. Yeah, it has nothing to do with that. And it really would have to be A or B. Now, it's not always going to be that way. Like, well, if they're opposite, no, but when you get it down to two opposites, you know, so why isn't it A? Uh, we got shares of Toyota Motor Corporation. And they just declared a big old dividend in the yen. How many dollars does that turn out to be? If the dollar is strong, it might only take a quarter to equal a yen. So all those yen are just paid out as quarters. So weakening is good. What? Yeah, if it strengthens, hey, here, this quarter is strong enough to equal your little yen over there. You know, that means that this thousand yen dividend is just 250 bucks. Well, what if the dollar were weak? It takes three dollars to equal a yen. Thousand yen is now three thousand dollars. So you can't use little tricks like, well, I, I figured weak is bad, strong is good. That's how people miss questions over and over, you know. But you can't make up some philosophy. Well, it seems like it's always the opposite of what I think, and therefore, no, just if you're experiencing that, you need to study more and slow down. A lot of you are figuring this is more like college. I put in the time, 
when I start doing the practice questions, they just go boom, boom, boom. Uh, no, not here, not ever. When I take the test, I do it exactly like this. I mean, I don't do a monologue, but I would never just grab the right answer. I'd say, well, it's obviously not C or D. And as one would think, it would have to be either weaken or strengthen. And I see what you want me to say, but the right answer is B. Nissan would be another one. What's funny is this currency exchange risk is so temporary and minor. I don't know why we make such a big deal out of it, but the test, the test world, uh, you know, certainly could. But when when I was on the website for Nestle, which is Swiss, like you know, if you buy our ADR, there could be some fluctuation in the currency, but this would usually be very minor. Yeah, and it usually is. All right, and why is this chatty? What's the deal? This is a perfect example. Remember that kid in college who never seemed to go to class or study, but he got B's and A's? You know, he just always saw the internal, internal logic of any question. And here, well, I got a three, a four, and a one. Yes, yeah, see, we're using that against that kid now. Because if you don't know what you're doing, they're all correct, right? I'll just add three, four, and one. Uh, no, I guess I, oh, I see. It's four on one side, three, and one on the other. So it's zero. Well, if you don't know what you're doing, you got a 25% chance. All right. Is there anything I don't need to know here? GDP. But they don't give you something that is not a common topic within the material. Otherwise, you just throw it away. Well, that has nothing to do with anything. You know, well, GDP is, is important, but not here. So all they're really doing is trying to take a simple concept and make it hard. Your client got a total return of four. Okay, that's great. Yeah, is that better or worse than the rate of inflation? It's that. It's one better. Sometimes that's all you can hope for. But that's why people invest in stocks. If you look in our textbook and you see how I explain what you would have missed out on the indexed annuity, several years, 29%, 19%. And somebody's like, yeah, but it was negative two that one time. Yeah, I got over it. So least likely. So three equal the best really uh, recommendations. Yeah. And of course, I'm going to make tips look different because a lot of you are, you know, Sesame Street kids. One of these things is not like the other. And, you know, uh, why are you talking about no load? Because we like to mess with you. Okay. Why are you saying non-convertible? Well, that's actually important. All right, this is all messed up. I had this good textbook by Exam Zone, and they taught me that if you're worried about purchasing power, you got to be in the stock market. And then B and C don't even say stock. Right, we're trying to see what you know. Large cap, small cap, mid cap, those are stock funds. And then you also have to say, and, and because they're good, I'm going to eliminate them. Right. Yeah, but I, I learned that it's stock. You learned that it was common stock. This is preferred stock. What? Well, why are you saying non-convertible? Well, they probably wouldn't go that far, but as long as we're doing negative words, it, it is an important detail, just in case you were thinking, uh, it, well, what if it's convertible? Well, we're saying it specifically is not. So it's really just, Preferred stock by itself might have been a better answer to make it hard. Preferred stock, you know, but why not do a, a negative word as well? So when you see preferred stock, you, you would already assume it's not convertible. Convertible is the exception that proves the rule. It's a hybrid. It's kind of common, kind of preferred, kind of weird. But dissect what's going on here. There are many ways they're trying to steer you wrong. We're making tips look unique. A lot of people figure that's all you got to do. We know you're looking for the word stock. And so the two answers that would be good don't have it. And the one answer that has stock is the one you would not recommend, but that's good. Some people will do that. Oh yeah, yeah, I wouldn't recommend A, let me cross it out. Wait, you're asking me what I wouldn't recommend? Right. All right, this is a good one too. They're all good. You really gotta know your investment risks because if you don't, how can you really help an investor? All right, market risk. That doesn't look tempting. That could come from all kinds of stuff. This is the unexpected tsunami, uh, nuclear disaster type dealio, pandemic. Um, 
Although somehow the stock market did well during the pandemic. We don't want to get into that. Liquidity risk. Does that look like liquidity risk? Uh, how do you avoid that? Don't buy municipal bonds. Those are slow. And don't buy limited partnerships because you might not even be able to sell. That includes hedge funds. You know, don't buy over-the-counter bulletin board stocks. So is it political or legislative? Well, it should be political, right? And that's why it's falsely familiar. I mean, that's the, that's the word that comes to mind, and I'm helping you by making a choice A. Political risk is really about emerging markets. Watch out when you invest in Brazil or China or India. It's actually called that. So when it's talking about Congress changing the tax code, OSHA, EPA, as a general rule, when a Democrat takes over the White House and they control the House, you're going to see a lot of pipeline projects getting shut down and then vice versa, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that's legislative risk. You know, if you're investing in energy sector, uh, which can be tough, you know, there's a lot of legislative risk. But here, same thing. Well, can you imagine having a big portfolio of municipal bonds and then all of a sudden, sorry, Congress didn't want to do it, but they did. And there is no exemption on any of that interest. So what? Well, everyone would dump municipal bonds. It would be the negative news for the week. And that's the, that's one of the risks that you have to take. Can't take risk, you know, you keep your money in uh, bank and insurance products, and then you have inflation risk. So you can never eliminate risk. You just figure out which ones you can take. Anyway, a falsely familiar answer is exactly like this. Political risk looks better and it's wrong. And then here, which two are unsystematic and shut up. Um, so let's just label them. Interest rate is across the board. Rates up, price down, right? Remember you typed that and you all thought that? Across the board, if I own bonds, when rates go up, the market prices drop. And the only thing that matters here is how long is the term on the bond. Uh, Legis inflation. I'm in preferred stock or bonds. The CPI is now at a 5% rate. I'm only getting two and a half. So across the board, I don't care who issued it. I don't care what sector they're in. You are in fixed income. You always have to worry about one in four. These two are why we diversify. I would love to put all my money in Snapchat because it's been going way up. Well, that's how a lot of people lose money in the market. Snapchat could be, oh yeah, and I, I just heard a podcast and I'm thinking maybe I need to dump it. The, the, the results of advertising, uh, it, listen to the podcast, uh, it seems to be a bubble. They, and, and I think we found it out too. If you've ever tried to do social media advertising, anyway, 98% of Facebook's revenue is advertising. If, if it ever comes out that they are not giving you results and that this next big company just stopped, wow. And it's all because of that business, but also... Uh, they're, and social media is starting to experience a lot of legislative pressure. We're going to come after them for lots of reasons, you know? So anyway, uh, that's why I don't want to, I'm in Snapchat and Twitter, but I better get out of that sector now because of business risk and legislative risk, right? Anyway, interest rate risk and inflation, that's for fixed income. And in, again, it, here's how you want to think this through. It took me a while, but when I finally made my breakthrough, does this risk have to do with the company and or its industry group? If so, it's unsystematic and it can be diversified. That's why you don't, you don't want to get too much into energy or social media. But if it's just, hey, when rates go up, all debt securities drop, that's systematic. Market risk, interest rate, and inflation are really the systematic risks. And uh, modern portfolio theory says that's the only type of risk anyone should be expected to be compensated for. And so that efficient frontier is from low risk to high risk. We're trying to do optimal portfolios. If you can take on more of the market risk, you know, we'll try to get you the most efficient high risk portfolio anyway.